Uh, the last news conference I held here was on February 16 on inflation, where multiple senators referenced incredibly high gas prices as well as prices across the commodities. And since that time, the inflation numbers have kept on coming in as growing. While Russian aggression and necessary responses are sure to push prices even higher with regard to gas, the skyrocketing gas prices have been a more than a year in the making. And the purpose of this press conference is to respond specifically on the administration's efforts to say, well, the inflation is really a, you know, a responsibility of Putin, not a responsibility of the actions of this administration. Uh, I think the fact that the inflation was roaring for a year before Vladimir Putin even uh, started the invasion in Ukraine uh, on multiple products, not just oil and gas, uh, is just proof in and of itself. But from the time that President Biden took office to just before Russia invaded Ukraine, gas prices increased by 48 percent. You can see both charts here. This one shows January of 2021 when the president took office. A 48 percent increase in gas prices before this line, which is where the invasion began. Now, this chart shows that in that time frame, gas went up by $1.15 per gallon. Post-inflation, driven by the war in Ukraine and by the further pressures on inflation that have been driven by administration policies, the gas has gone up another 71 cents. The point is clear. The war in Ukraine with regard to oil and gas has had an impact on oil prices. It's not the reason that the majority of the increase in oil prices has occurred. Why did they occur? Because in the last 14 months, the Democrats, including the president, have been attacking the American oil and gas industry and stopping our own production. Before the president took office, we were energy independent and we were actually supplying liquid national, natural gas uh, to Europe in competition with Russia. But today, that is all ramping down and America is now, once again, energy dependent because of the attack on our American oil and gas production, which includes everything from the Keystone XL pipeline to the refusal to grant any new leases or extend any permits off offshore or on our federal properties or things that I'm sure others of my colleagues will go into in more detail. The solution is not a gimmick like reducing the or eliminating for a short period of time the tax on gasoline or the uh, falsely named windfall profits tax that really is an effort to tax our American producers if they increase their production. They don't control the price of oil. They can control the amount of their production. And if they try to get back in the game, the proposal is to tax them, which will simply drive the price of gas up higher. Uh, the problem here is that the administration, and what we're here to focus on today, is that the administration has a war on our own American energy independence. And that's what needs to be addressed in America to try to deal with the rising cost of fuel and the rising cost of many other products that are fuel dependent. And with that, I'll turn now to Senator Barrasso for his remarks. Well, thanks, Mike. The, uh, the Democrats know they have a very serious problem when it comes to American families, people who pay their bills. And what they see is people at home, they're seeing gas prices at an all-time high, inflation at a 40-year high. And people know what they want. They want energy security. They want economic security. And American families don't believe they're getting it from the Democrats, from the White House, from this House or the Senate, run by Democrats because of those extreme climate positions of this administration. Now, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are desperately trying to find somebody to blame. They've been trying over the last 14 months. They're blaming everything but themselves. COVID, the economy, the supply chain, corporations, Putin. Blame, 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 but don't look in the mirror. That's the Democrats' answer to this. Now they want to try something new. The Democrats now say we're, they're going to go to political grandstanding. 
They say they want to bring in energy company executives so they can use them as political props. Browbeat them, lecture them, scold them. And Pelosi has a committee all set up to do that. And you think in the Senate, they ought to come to the Senate Energy Committee because it's the Energy Committee that's going to do it in the, in the House. Well, I'd love for them to come in front of the Senate Energy Committee with Joe Manchin and me answer, asking the questions. Because then we could actually get to the root cause of the increase in costs that took us from here to here before all of this started. We can find out why production right now is down 1.3 million barrels of oil a day in the United States compared to where it was before the pandemic. We can hear from them firsthand about the way that this administration has tied them up in red tape. Drilling permits, oil and gas leases, tied them up completely. And how the administration has blocked the permits to build the pipelines, to move gas to market or to the refineries. All of these things. And then, of course, we want to get them to testify and explain to us how this administration has threatened banks and lending institutions so they won't lend money to the people who want to go out and explore for energy. These are all done by this administration. We also want to hear from the administration how many, not from the administration, they won't give us the answer. We've been trying to hear from the administration on the number of jobs that have been lost because of these policies. We'll be able to hear from people if they come and testify how many people aren't at work today in America in the energy industry producing American energy because of what this administration has done to shut down American energy. And I contend, as do all of us, that the people in America producing energy do it by much higher environmental standards than does Venezuela, Iran, Russia. We'll ask them about the difference in the standards in terms of if it's a global environment that people are concerned about, how much cleaner do we do it here in the United States than they do it anywhere else? And while we're asking these questions, maybe we ought to have John Kerry come in, too. I mean, he's the one that said that he was concerned that what was happening uh, with Russia and Ukraine, this is his word, would distract from his climate agenda, distract from a climate agenda. People are being murdered in the streets. And he's worried about the distraction. I also want to ask him about what his thoughts were, because he made his comments earlier that he was hoping that Vladimir Putin would keep his climate commitments. How do you think that's going? I'd like to ask the former Secretary of State about that. And then maybe we could ask the Joe Biden, either President Biden or the administration why they have Venezuela and Iran on speed dial, but block the calls coming from American oil and gas workers. Joe Biden clearly deserves the label of the president of high gas prices. Thank you. Next is Senator Sullivan, then Senator Scott, Portman, Hyde Smith, and Boozman. Well, thank you. And I, I just want to begin by reminding everybody um, these were the president's campaign promises. And now I'm quoting President Biden when he was running for office. I guarantee you we're going to end fossil fuels. No more drilling on federal lands. No more drilling, including offshore. No ability for the oil industry to continue to drill. Period. It ends. Number one. That's quotes from President Biden as a candidate. Now, on this issue, he's certainly kept his promise. And... The administration continues its policies from day one uh, to undermine American working families with higher energy prices and empower dictators abroad, and then going now to beg dictators abroad for more energy. Since the brutal invasion of Ukraine, President, the president's top White House economic advisor Brian D. said, quote, the only path to energy independence is to reduce American fossil fuel use to zero. So that's, that was a quote since the invasion. So let me give you two areas in which this administration is doing that. One is on our federal regulators that the administration is putting forward. The way to get the nod from this president is to make sure you as a federal regulator, 
make a commitment to wage a holy war against American energy, even if it has nothing to do with the mandate in which you are being nominated for. Think about it. Comptroller of the currency, federal nominee Raskin, SEC Chairman Gensler, the FERC, that put out new rules to make it harder to produce and transport natural gas. Literally the opposite of FERC's legitimate legislative mandate. But here's the second one I want to emphasize. And again, it goes to federal lands. On day one of the administration, day one, the acting secretary of the interior, Scott De La Vega, I have no idea who he is, never even heard of him, he put forward a memo saying 60 days, we're stopping everything. Read the memo. Read the memo. Everything in terms of oil and gas on federal lands. That was just about a year ago. Right after that, this is a really important memo, about a year ago, March 19th, 2021, the Assistant Secretary of Lands and Minerals in the Department of Interior, Laura Daniel Davis, she put out a memo saying, not on leases, but for what are called applications to drill. She said, and it's in here, every application to drill in America has to be approved by her every single one. The way it normally works with federal agencies, say in Alaska, you have what's called a field manager who might be in charge of the BLM area in the interior part of the state. Then you have a state director. Those people, those federal officials, normally can approve applications to drill. The, the detailed permits that are required to actually produce oil and gas on leases. This assistant secretary, so that's the way it works across the country. This assistant secretary said, every person at these lower levels in America, you now have to get approval from me. Completely consolidating it in Washington, D.C. on every single application to drill in the country. Okay. There's 4,600 of these still waiting to be approved. This memo still exists. She still has consolidated that power to make that decision everywhere in America. You might want to ask the White House about this because this is exactly the kind of thing that is stalling the production of American energy. The president has said, I'm going to use every tool available to, pro to try to increase or decrease American energy prices. The president needs to rescind this memo right now. That's one tool available that he could do tonight. 4,600 applications to drill stalled because the Department of Interior has said they're going to approve everything in Washington, D.C. Senator Scott. Thank you. <clears throat> We've all heard that it's been said, elections have consequences. And without any question, looking back to December of 2020, before President Biden was sworn into office, driving into a gas station in South Carolina where the gas price was $1.99. Last year, not this year, but last year, gas prices in South Carolina $3.40 per gallon. Yes, elections have consequences. I wish the administration was listening to people working across South Carolina as I do. Sitting in Longhorn's restaurant before I flew back to Washington on a Monday, the, the young lady, wait, the waitress at the table, tells me that she moved from the north to South Carolina, a, a good choice. She wanted a higher quality of life and a more affordable place to live. Uh, I recommend that for everybody in their retirement. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. But the truth is that literally coming to South Carolina to experience that higher quality of life and a more affordable place to live, she, she starts talking to me. She says, sir, I put $92 in my tank this morning. And I thought about that. 
If the average American, the median income in this country is around $17 to $17.50 an hour, once you take the taxes out, it means that she has to work the first six or seven hours of her work week just to put gas in that tank. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is not an issue about partisan politics. This is an issue of how failed leadership feels to the average worker on an average wage in our country. They deserve better from this administration. They deserve gas prices that they can afford. Think about our average Social Security recipient that receives around $1,500 a month. If you're spending somewhere around $100 or $150 a month in increased cost, that's 10%, 10% of your retirement income. We're not talking about what it takes to get the food to the store. We're just talking about the gas in your car. And so everything that it takes gas to get it to the shelves, to the store, if that all goes up, it lands on the average household as a 40-year high in inflation. And inflation is nothing more or less than an invisible tax that becomes visible because of the pain and the challenges that everyday people, including that wonderful waitress who spends the first seven hours of her weekly shift putting gas in her car. Senator Department. Well, Senator Scott said it well. Um, I need to keep that chart up here, though. You, you, you taking it away? Um, <laughs> John Kennedy has a joke. He says, I don't like to brag about the expensive places I go to, but I went to the gas station last week. And um, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, I, I filled up my pickup truck about three weeks ago now. I haven't driven much since because I'm uh, not wanting to fill it up again. It's nine, 94 bucks. And, you know, to the guy or the woman who is commuting, who has a fixed income, or middle income, lower income families I represent, uh, you know, that's a killer. They are spending more and more, not just on gas. This is about utility bills, too. In Ohio, our utility bills have gone up about 40 percent. A lot of that's natural gas. So it's about energy production generally, and it is affecting our economy in a very significant way, as we see with inflation and people's wages not being able to keep up with inflation. People are underwater now. You know, during the couple of years before the pandemic, we had wage increases every month, actually 19 months of wage increases. But significantly, they were 3% or more every month. I mean, they were above inflation every month. Now it's just the opposite. Inflation's here, wages are here. They've gone up some, but not nearly as much as, as inflation. I like these charts because they show two things. One, they, they show that the truth is not that this is because of the Ukrainian war. I mean, it was already going up. And in fact, it was on an upward trajectory, okay? This chart shows, you know, where we were in terms of gas prices. And I know what you're wondering. So I'm, I'm gonna do the math for you because you're wondering, well, what, what is the overall percentage? Like how much of this 48% increase in gas and 20% increase happened pre and post? So this would be 62%. So 62% of the increase happened before the invasion, remembering, it was already going up, so it would have gone up some since then. And this is 38% after the invasion. Now, I'm not saying that what Russia did helped in terms of energy prices. It definitely has an impact, definitely, including our decision, which was the right decision for our country and for the national security of our country to cut off our Russian oil coming into this country and then revenue going back to Russia to fund the war machine. But this is what the facts indicate. So it's not accurate for the Biden administration to say, this is Vladimir Putin's gas increase. It just isn't accurate. Does it contribute? Absolutely, it contributes. But the majority of it was already happening and the trajectory was, was already increasing. 
There's another issue that I'd like to mention because we're at war here uh, in Ukraine with Russia. We're trying to help Ukraine all we can. We're trying to ensure that the revenues that Vladimir Putin gets from the rest of the world dry up through sanctions, right? So there's war machine isn't being funded and he can't continue to kill innocent civilians as he is doing every single day, every single night, bombing schools and hospitals and apartment buildings. Well, our biggest challenge, as I see it right now, is military assistance, which we're starting to do more of. I wish we could do even more. I think we can. But second is the revenues coming into his economy. You probably saw they're going to reopen their stock market in Russia. They, you probably saw the, the ruble was viewed as stabilizing this week. Why? Because he's getting a lot of revenue <laughs> from his oil and gas sales to Europe, to Asia, India, China. That's funding this war machine. So what's one of the answers to that? One of the answers is, I hope, one that the President of the United States will talk to his NATO colleagues about tomorrow and make a very strong case that they need to embargo the Russian oil and gas also. Because if they don't, and if other countries around the world don't, he'll continue to have the money to send those missiles to kill those innocent civilians, right? That's his number one revenue source. It's their number one export. So we can come up with all sorts of ways to take away most favored nation treatment. I support that to do away with the tax treaty. I support that to put in place our own embargo on Russian oil. But if we don't deal with this issue, it's going to be very, very difficult for the Ukrainian people to survive this conflict. One way to do it is to tell our NATO partners, if you get away from your dependency on Russian energy, we'll be there. And our allies will be there. Countries in the Middle East, as an example, like Qatar, who have said that they're happy to send liquefied natural gas into Europe to help to backfill some of this loss of energy they're getting from Russia if they make the right decision. We need to do the same thing. The export terminals for LNG are able to be constructed very quickly. We can construct more of them. The import terminals with the new technology, we can get those going quickly in, in Europe. There's some already. We need to flood the zone. We need to provide the Europeans more energy from this country. But we can't do that if we have an administration that's saying, on the one hand, we want to beat Putin, and on the other hand, we want to stifle energy production in this country. Because those allies of ours depend on natural gas from Russia. They need it. We need to provide more production in this country to be able to provide them the energy that they need to be able to say no to Putin and yes to the freedom of the Ukrainian people, to no to tyranny, and, and yes to the Ukrainian people have a chance to survive. So this is related to the pump. It is, and it's painful for people, but it's also related to something even bigger, and that is the ability for us to be effective at stopping this cowardly and brutal invasion of Ukraine. Thank my colleagues. Senator Bozeman. Senator Hyde-Smith, Senator Young. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. And I think the charts and what we've said really does sum things up. I want to go, go about it in a little different way. The mayor of Monette, Arkansas, called the office the other day. And in Arkansas, we, we don't do things at the mayor's level in a partisan way. These are nonpartisan offices. I don't know if he's a Democrat or Republican or whatever. I know he's a very hardworking individual that takes uh, really good care of his community. His message was the price of diesel is, is pushing to the point where it's starting to impact city services. In other words, because of the price of diesel and his concern that it's going to go ahead and continue to go up, he's not going to be able to provide the basic city services that he has in the past. This is a major crisis. It's a rare crisis where the answer is simply staring us in the face. We've got the resources. We've got the technology to produce our own energy and bring prices down and do it in a very, very environmentally sensitive way. And, uh, you know, everyone's talked about the idea of getting oil from Venezuela or Saudi Arabia. Again, what does that do to the environment? It's time we act on it and stop putting our country at the mercy of others. And Americans simply can't afford it any longer. Thank you very much.
Thank you, and I want to thank you for being here today because our message needs to be heard. Anyone who thinks that the war on U in Ukraine has anything to do with our fuel prices, that is totally ludicrous. This is pretty clear. These are facts, it's evidence, and it tells you the true story. You know, when I think of the Biden administration all the time, I want to say, what did you think would happen? When you shut down the Keystone Pipeline, what did you really think would happen? President Biden and the Democrats, not only do they have to own this, they have to wear this, but the American people are having to wear it with them. You know, it is just such um, their motive to blame someone else, and they're trying to blame this here, and instead of acknowledging we made a mistake, we need to correct that mistake. And I mean, after a year of these anti-energy policies and having their heads literally in the sand, you know, they're finally turning their attention to high gas prices, and they're finally looking at, you know, whose fault is it? It's very simple how we got to where we are. And the kicker is the grand plan that they have right now, it excludes diesel, a major blow to truckers and American agriculture. In Mississippi, we're an agricultural state. It's the number one industry in Mississippi. We have to have these big rigs to get our product to market, to get our harvest to market. To fill up one of those trucks, it's 150 gallons, and that's just one time. You know, we talk about taking $90 to fill up our cars. That's just one time. It doesn't last very long when you're taking kids to school, when you're going to work. And then you have to fill up, go to the pump and fill up again. But it has been so much, it's far more than a year that the waged war on American energy has taken place. And the best they can come up with is an election-driven political gimmick, a gas tax holiday, which, by the way, it ends after the election. So this isn't helping anyone. We need to come up with solutions and force this administration to actually help Americans. We all drive, we all eat, we all have a car to get us to where we need to be in most circumstances. And in Mississippi, Mississippians are hurting just like the rest of this country. So I just plead and beg with this administration, step up, do something that's going to actually help with American people instead of just help for an election. Please just do that for the American people. Thank you. Senator Young. <clears throat> so Friday night, uh, my 12-year-old twins had a birthday party. And, uh, you know, I was, I was really struck. They're great kids. They're incredibly appreciative uh, kids. But the presents came out. And I was thinking of that old adage, it's the thought that counts. If you really want to test the proposition of uh, it's the thought that counts, have a 12-year-old birthday party, right? And that's relevant to uh, our, our current events here because I, I read over the weekend in, in the wake of that birthday party that the administration was actually thinking of, of sending gas cards to all Americans so that they could deal with the high price of, of uh, uh, they're experiencing at the pump. Just add this to a long, long list of bad ideas we've seen from the Democrats with respect to dealing with all manner of, of price inflation. They talked about gas cars. They've, they've talked about suspending taxes on gas. They've talked about raising taxes on gas. We've had the President of the United States uh, weigh in with autocrats around the world to increase production to bring down the price. This is the number one con concern of my constituents today. And the best Washington Democrats can come up with is to subsidize demand, just as they've proposed in child care, just as they've uh, proposed in housing affordability, just as they uh, have consistently proposed in the area of health care. So they're subsidizing demand at the very time they want to increase costs through regulations. It's nonsensical. It's absurd. We know what the only real and lasting solutions are. We need to increase American energy production. This means eliminating regulations, not adding to them, so that we can increase production here domestically. It means expediting permits, bringing more capacity online. 
means encouraging new private sector investments. If we don't take these common sense steps, best Washington Democrats will say is it's the thought that counts. Well, thank you. We have a time for a couple of questions here. We'll go the first two hands were these two ladies right here. Let's do that, and we'll do the, then we'll do you two ladies, and then we'll be done. Well, we've got a couple of experts behind me, but let me take the first quick shot at this and then let my colleagues answer. But uh, it, the bill you're talking about is the so-called uh, windfall profits tax proposal. The notion is based on the fact that oil companies are just artificially driving the price of oil up because they have a chance in this market. Uh, the fact is that the price of oil is not controlled by these companies. They don't set that price. The price of, of crude oil today in the world is a part of a very deep and rich and competitive global market. And that is what supply and demand in that market determines the price of gas. The bill you're referencing is one, if I understand it correctly, calls it a windfall profit tax if our producers produce more fuel, more gas. And they'll be taxed on producing more, not raising the price. In other words, do not produce any more gas. If you do, then we will say that you're gouging. And you're making more money because you're selling more gas, not because you've gouged the price. Now, if I, have I got that right? Uh, uh, just a, yeah, just a, just a, a quick comment on that. Because it's, well, it's easy to get whiplash trying to watch this because you have the frightened four of the Democrats who are running this year, who the four of them came out with a bill to do a, a gas tax holiday to say people will then lo lower their rates by about 18 cents, or, you know, uh, which to me is just a Band-Aid on a bullet hole. They put the bullet hole in the, the, into the energy industry, and now they want to put a little Band-Aid over it by lowering it, oh, but only, as, only until after the election. Then if they get reelected, going right back up. So those are those four. And then you have 12 others who want to put additional taxes if they produce more. We're still 1.3 million barrels of oil a day less being produced right now than we were before the pandemic. We need to produce more. And they say we're going to penalize the companies that produce more by increasing a tax on them. It's going to raise the prices for people. So, you know, you got, they got their own war going on in the Democrat Party right now. Yes, ma'am, you were not. Can oh, I did just you want to, real, oh, sure. real briefly touch on that? Because we, we see this time and again. Look, we have to just follow market forces here. We can bring more production, on, uh, more supply into the market. Uh, and uh, that will help lower the price. And, and uh, we, we hear these accusations from Democrats all the time about how markets are, are failing us. Well, when, when prices decrease, they'll allege predatory pricing. When prices go up the same rate across different companies, they'll allege uh, parallel pricing. And then when prices increase, they'll allege monopolistic pricing. So regardless of the pricing, the Democrat answer is markets aren't working. Well, what we need to do here is, 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 frankly, it's the exact opposite. We need to marshal our, our market forces by increasing pr uh, supply, and, and that will lower the price. We know that. Yes, yes sir. Yeah, it, was, it was back here. Yeah. Um, the Republican General Assembly and Republican governor in Georgia, as well as the Republican governor in Maryland, have signed temporary gas tax suspensions that you guys have just described as gimmicks and band-aids on a bullet hole. So do you say that to them? Do you think those state suspensions are also gimmicks and not um, effective? Well, I would just say every, every state has the right to determine its own policies. Uh, I, th I think that a gas tax holiday, if you will, is something that every American would say I'd love to have. It's 18 cents on that, on that uh, gallon of gas if it really does come off of the whole gallon. There are economists who say that it won't work, that it will actually drive the price of gas up or that it won't change the price of gas. Uh, but what American wouldn't say that they want to have uh, a, an elimination of a part of their taxes? I think it's a gimmick. Even if you accept it as on face as an 18 cent change in this chart, 
it, it's not a solution. And, and the main thing is, it's not a solution to what caused that price. It doesn't have an impact on that price unless the economists who say it will make it go up are right. So I, I don't know. I just tell them that, but it's their job. They can do what they want in their own and, state. And the only other thing I would add to that is, uh, and I assume they weren't going after the federal tax holiday because they don't have the right to do that. It's probably, a, what do you say, a Maryland and a Georgia. And I'm not sure what the tax rates are in those states for the specifics of, this, of the guest of Hillary. Um, oil and gas groups wrote a letter to the president last week saying, talking about the backlog of drill permits, saying that that needs to be cleared, and also talking about environmental reviews that they have to undergo and that can delay <coughs> drilling for years. Um, so if the Biden administration is serious at ramping up oil and gas production, should they immediately clear the backlog of drill permits and waive or expedite the environmental review process? And if they don't, can Congress do anything about that? Well, the short answer is yes, they should. And uh, Congress could, but only if we can get the majority in both the House and the Senate to move that kind of legislation. Did I get that wrong, John? No, no, you're right. <laughs> and then on, there's an idea in, in the House and reportedly under consideration by the White House that we would send stimulus checks to people to help pay for gas and kind of <coughs> subsidize that in some way. Would that ultimately make the problem worse if inflation is the root of part of why gas is rising? My answer is yes, because essentially the inflation that we are seeing now is, I think, largely driven by the phenomenal amount of spending that has gone on from Washington, in, not just in last, this last year, but in the response to COVID and in other activities. And uh, if you add more federal spending, even if it's to give some temporary relief in terms of a gas card or something, you are adding to the demand side of that supply and demand economy that we live in and uh, the end result ultimately will be higher inflationary pressures. We've got to deal with the supply side, and that's what the message has been from here. Yeah, we're still 1.3 million barrels a day less made in the United States now than during the pandemic, and we need to get that up and to just send, whether it's checks, whether it's gas cards, any of those things, it doesn't contribute to the, the solution of having more available energy for Americans to buy when they go shopping. Yes, the last, last question. question? Delaying uh, the aid sent to Ukraine, delaying uh, actions against Putin. Senator Fagel, do you want language codifying a ban on Russian oil to be added to the PNTR bill? Would that be delaying, though, that trade legislation from, from coming through? It's an interesting thing. <clears throat> the, the bill you're talking about was originally a bipartisan, bicameral bill about two weeks ago. Right, before the president. Exactly. And at that time, the president intervened and said, stop that bill and take out the oil ban because I'm going to do it tomorrow. And uh, what he wanted was, if I understand it right, he didn't want the language in the bill on the oil ban that dealt with his ability to withdraw the oil ban. In other words, to give Congress a right to review his actions on the oil ban. And so he himself delayed it. The House then delayed it and has still delayed having us move that forward. And now they've put, uh, put me and, and the Republicans in a position of saying, wait a minute, you want to pass a piece of the response, but kill a piece of the response. And so it is true that slowing them down, what I said on the floor just before I came in here was, we only need to slow down for a few hours so that you can fix the bill. And we are ready to move immediately. Uh, but if there is delay, if, if they don't accept my offer to do exactly what was a bipartisan, bicameral solution, got over 400 votes in the House, but is sitting in the House right now with no action. If they refuse to move forward on that, who's causing the delay? And I guess I would say, yeah, I'm slowing their ability down to rush through and stop doing the bill. But what I'm doing is speeding up their ability to get the whole bill put together. Well, I can't predict that. I, I had thought we would have one by now. And uh, I hope that we have one by nightfall tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all very much.